Hello everyone! Once again, it is I! Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm running solo tonight. Um, I've been busting my ass the past few days trying to get the Christmas special done. Uh, it, uh, hopefully I'll still get it done. Uh, and it, <laughs> I gotta get it done in a couple days when I'm gonna get deadline, but that's a whole other thing! Uh, but because there's so many movies coming out on the 25th, and so many movies on now that I haven't had time to check out, I say, you know what, fuck it, I'll go take out the big one now, just to get over with. Um, so I just got out of The Hobbit, The Rise of the Third Movie. Uh, now, if you watched a review last year of The Hobbit movie, I just knew I liked the second one. I liked the first one, too. Uh, what I think about this one, I liked it. Like, I liked it. I was entertained by it. Um, is it perfect? No. Honest to God, there's some very interesting ideas. Ideas here, and I kind of wish they were more fleshed out. But uh, oop, well, oh, my lines all fucked up. Me, me. There you go. Okay. Uh, like I said, there were some very interesting ideas here. Some I liked some of the directions they were going in. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it is lost in the third act of the film, and that's kind of where it kind of lost me a little bit. Not completely. Like I said, I was still entertained by what I got. But they could have done more. They could have done a lot, lot more. And I would, I wish they took it more in that direction. Uh, allow me to elaborate. So, the first big problem in the movie is that the opening sequence is really, really good. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's Smog, he's coming to Lake Town, he's destroying the whole city, then Bard comes up to take him down, and of course he does. I mean, here's the thing, if you're basing this off the book, or, like, you're expecting any faithfulness to the book at this point, yeah, you're gonna hate this movie. Um... Uh, I guess from like what Muha and Cody were saying, I guess a lot of this draws from what is called like the Red Book, which is like uh, Tolkien's unpublished backstory information on the ser on the f on the whole series. Uh, I don't know how much that is true in this case. Like I'd have to talk to people who actually know about it more. But just uh, from what I saw, it's like yeah, you can tell they're drawing a lot more from the other lesser known elements of the Tolkien world. Like for example, there's these giant thing like giant worm things called millworms who tunnel underground and I guess they help the orcs tunnel in by the lonely mountain where they end up in their final battle uh, and stuff like that there's more monsters there's more creative monsters more like different kinds of ogres and different kinds of trolls which was actually cool I like that they mixed up their design a lot in that way um, anyway back to my first complaint about the movie is the fact that the opening sequence is really really fucking good but it feels like it should have been the climax to the last movie. And, yeah, it's kind of, it's not a big deal. Like it's And it's so good, though, that I feel like the rest of the movie has to match back up to that. And it, it never really does. Like, it tries its best. It gets close one or two times, but it not as close. Like, the, the opening sequence was good. It was it was very very cool looking like there's a lot of cool stuff going on a lot of devastation a lot of what kind of you expect smog to do and the nice thing it's short it's a short opening sequence it doesn't stick around longer than it has to it's there and it's over and you feel like okay that was a good way to end that um the third act of this movie not so much but i'll get to that um but after that there is the like oddly enough of all the lord of the rings movies this one is the most political. And I actually really, really liked that direction they're going with. Because, like, again, I mentioned this in previous reviews where, like, this, the first one was getting to the mountain. The second one was conquering the mountain. And the third one is more like, what the hell do you do once you have that? And I think that's a really smart direction to take it. And they go some interesting routes with it. Like I said, unfortunately, though, a lot of it is diminished when you have the big orc army come in at towards the third act. This isn't a shock. It's in all the trailers. It's alluded to in the first couple movies. You know this is coming. But the problem is, is, like, for the first time in the Lord of the Rings se series ever, and I really like that they did this, is, like, uh, the people of Lake Town now have a ruined home, and they have to go to the, and they have to go to Dale, which is, like, the destroyed ancient city right over by the, uh, the kingdom of whatever and the and the lonely mountain, so they kind of hunker down there. But they kind of knock, they kind of go over to the doors like, "Hey, where's this gold you promised us? You know, you are kind of responsible for the destruction of our city. Where's our gold? Can we like, can we have some of that? We're not trying to steal. We just want what you promised us." And then you have the elves, uh, played once again by 
uh, what the fuck was that guy? That guy from Pushing Daisies. Uh, he, he comes in. He wanting the diamonds that are in the that are in the mountain that he feels are aliens to his people and therefore is his right to collect them. But then you have Thorin, who's uh, become much more greedy with the gold, and now he doesn't want anyone to have the gold. He wants it all, so he's gonna keep it all. And he's gonna lock himself in the tower, and b claiming that because it is his people, it is his right, and therefore no one else has right has right to it. Now, what made that interesting though is like this is the first movie where there's well, I mean of course Bard. Bard is like the clear alpha male good guy, but other than that though, there's really there's a lot of kind of moral ambiguity, at least much more than the previous Lord of the Rings movies, and I thought that was kind of refreshing, like, as much as, as much as Thorin has become, like, an egotistical kind of evil dick, you get where he's coming from, and you get the same with the elf person, too, I mean, he's, again, not a very good person, but you, he doesn't want to just take all the gold, he only wants what's his, this whole issue can very easily resolve if they just give him the goal, if they just give him what they want and just get it over with. In fact, all this can be avoided if Thorin just gave everyone the very simple demands that they had. Uh, oh, I got headlights in front of me. Ah, blinded by the light. The gold, the gold is after me. Okay. But, um, uh, so I, I thought all that was interesting and I thought that was kind of leading into the war that was going to happen. Like, it was going to be between, uh, like, the elves and the townspeople kind of join forces because they kind of want the same thing. And then you have Thorin, who calls in his cousin. He brings his army in. And then I I was kind of getting into that. I just kind of wish that it was just about the conflict between these different races. But then, and I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm liking where this is going. Like, uh, Thorin, in this case, is like the character has a big full arc through the entire series. And... To give the credit, the parts where we were just focusing on the dwarves and Bilbo, all those scenes are pretty good. Like, um, I don't, I can't remember the guy who named plays Thorin, but he is, he does an excellent job here. He did a great job in the other two movies. Like, it is very interesting to see kind of, I did like how his story kind of, uh, concluded. All right, I kind of, that's what I'm looking for. I just like where a story was going. Like, there is clear progression from the first movie. We like, from, like, the selfless leader more towards the, per the the leader with an obsession to the greedy king to the repentive king and then the true leader that everyone deserves and all that. And I, I liked his little arc. I thought his arc was done very well. And, like I said, all the scenes where he's talking with the dwarves or Bilbo or the dwarves talking to each other is all very good. These are all very good actors. And especially Martin Freeman, again... As diminished as a part as Bilbo kind of becomes in this movie, he still does it very good. And I know, like, a lot of people might kind of look angry because, like, oh, the movie's called The Hobbit, but, like, Bilbo isn't in it all too much. And it's like, you know what? I was kind of okay with it because I was thinking about it I was watching this movie, and I kind of realized, it's like, Bilbo's role in this entire series isn't so much as the main hero that goes out and fights all the bad guys, it's just more as the, like, almost like the witness, like the chronicler of this grand event, and I like that. Uh, and I will say this about the movie too, is like, I complained in the last couple movies that the epic scale it was going for didn't quite feel justified for what is naturally a smaller story. And I think here, well, it's not perfect, it is much more justified. Like, it feels more earned in this case. Because, A, we know a lot of the people, rival fact, uh, factions. We've seen them before, we know how they interact with each other. And, like, the politics of why everyone's out there not only makes sense, but also gives reason for escalation. So all that is well done. Unfortunately, that's all kind of lost when the orc army comes in. And I know that's the big thing, like, the evil orc army comes in and everyone's gonna band together and fight back against the evil forces but at the same time you lose that ambiguity you lose the political conflicts you lose everything that built up that tension up to that point there was a great tension between bard and the elven king and thorin and all and thorin who alienates all his other dwarf friends so they're turning on him there's a lot of great tension here and you just lose that when you got the big bad guy with the one arm he has his other sword hand and shit 
who just comes in with a big orc army. It just it just loses so much of what made it interesting. And then it becomes exactly what I saw in Lord of the Rings Two Towers, exactly what I saw in Return of the King. It, there's not much new from that point forward. And that got old. And that's like the whole last like hour of the movie is this big long fight scene between all the other armies versus the orc army. And I guess that's just disappointing. You lose all of what made it interesting. <sighs> so yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I guess this is what happens when I talk when I do this by myself is I just end up ranting and raving. I guess that's kind of the point. But uh, anyway, uh, I guess that's what the disappointment though. It's like I really liked where they're going with it. I felt like they just kind of dropped it, and that was too bad. I mean, like I said, I liked. A lot of the new, they have a lot of new monster designs in this movie, and I really like that. Like, you have, like, these battering ram orcs who just have, <laughs> these orcs that just run, like, or not orcs, like, there's, like, a troll or something like that. Like, battery ram trolls who just have this, like, giant fuck-all concrete brick on their heads, and they just charge at the wall at full speed, and BAM! Just smash right into it. And you have, like, other, I guess they're maybe, like, other trolls who have, like, one little gimp hand and, like, one <laughs> gigantic hand they smash people with. And stuff like that. And all that stuff was cool. Um, I also, like I said, the stuff that I liked with the last two movies and, like, seeing characters I already know and, uh, and I already very well know do things I haven't seen them do before is always fun. Like, uh, there's a part where Gandalf is still captured in the evil, uh, like the evil orc tower, like where he was in the, lot, and then the second movie. And uh, Gladriel comes in, and she finally kicks some ass. Uh, not too much. She basically just does Dragon Ball Z shit. But, uh, but then Saruman kicks in, uh, comes in, and he just kicks everyone's ass. We see him fight fucking Ghost, which I don't know how you beat Ghost, to be honest. I think Ghost would probably win. But you see him like... Uh, because they come in and Sauron's there, and he's summoned up his nine evil human knight people. And they all fight uh, Gladriel and Saruman and Elrond, and they're all fighting each other. It's like, it's almost like a weird Middle Earth version of the A-Team. I might actually make that video, because actually it's like a really good idea, but uh... But yeah, and they come in and they just kick so much ass. And Saruman in particular, he's doing all these cool shit with magic. And it's actually it's actually such a nice change of pace to see, God forbid, a wizard actually use magic in a fight. Uh, so that was cool to see. And they go through all it bumping around. They're zipping from place to place. And I wasn't too happy that it was all special effect oriented, but I'm only gonna, I'll talk about that in a bit too. And they're all kicking ass and taking names, and they fight face Sauron, and they beat him, and he's banished to Mordor, where he's gonna be for the next movie. Uh, I just stick around for the like, and then it teases like it's gonna have a Sauron Sauron fight at some point. It never happens. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's at the end of the credits. I didn't stick around to see it, so maybe I missed that. I don't know. Uh, if there is, if it was, leave it in the comments, or I'll look it up later. But either way, that stuff was cool. That stuff I liked seeing. But like again, and even in the final act, there are some, there were some cool battle setups that were kind of fun, that were fun to watch. But it kind of leads into the one of my really big issue with the movie is that there are just so much fucking CGI, and it is so distracting. It has really just gone on my nerves because like. I know the last couple Hobbit movies have been more and more kind of pushing more towards CGI, but this one just felt really excessive. Here, like, it, I guess it really bothered me when, like, they had the one practical effects orc in there, and it legitimately caught me off guard that he was, like, actually there. And I was like, oh my god, that's an actual person. They actually make up a person to do this scene. I was like, I missed that. I missed that so much. It made me realize how much I missed that, because it's actually physically there. Towards the end, I'm it's like I'm not even watching an action movie at that point. I'm watching a cartoon. And that really irks me after a while. I mean, not normally it doesn't bother me too much, but this time I just feel like it was so excessive. Like, I don't know if he actually was or not, but Thorin has a dwarf cousin in this movie, and he comes in with his army to fight the elves. 
But I swear to God, even his face looks CGI. And I'm just like, you couldn't get another actor to get prosthetics for that role? You couldn't even do that. Ugh. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, like, I get why you CGI the trolls. I get why you CGI, like, the millworms and shit like that. I get that. But why did everything else need to be CGI? Why do you need so many CGI orcs? Why do you need so many CGI army people? Why do you need so many CGI landscapes and building structures? I mean, why do you need so much excessive CGI? <sighs> Maybe just more obvious in the other couple movies. I don't know. And again, it comes to the fact that CGI just isn't as good as it say if it was with Smog. Smog looked great, and he was a ton of fun to watch, but you can tell that's where the majority of the CGI budget went, was building that character. Not so much in everything else. Everything else is just like video game characters all flying off, and that's... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm bitching a lot, I, but I do want to make it clear that I did like this movie. I did like it. I guess I wish... I guess I'm kind of thinking more of what it could have been, because like... At this point, there's not much left. There's like almost none of the original Hobbit story left to tell. So why can't you do something more unique with a third one? I feel like this kind of this opportunity to really kind of go. I mean, they do some stuff new, but not enough. They they really had an opportunity to get more into the world rather than just have a strict, a straight evil, not evil storyline here. Uh so maybe I guess I'm just more upset about the wasted potential. But, uh, but like I guess a lot of that's there is good. I mean, it, I, this is probably the more tighter of the three Peter Jack, uh, like of all the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies, because it is the shortest, at least in the Hobbit series, probably not in general. But, um, uh, even then, though, some of the action scenes went on way too long. Like, can, I want, I just I do want to talk about this, though. I do want to talk about how fucking long it takes for the goddamn boss or characters to fucking die. I mean, they must have fake out deaths like three or four times each, and it just got to the point where it's like, okay, fucking die. Just fucking die. Like, you have the, um, the, the, the orc final boss from the last, from the last movie, and he ends up fighting, uh, Evangelina Lily's character from the last one, who is, uh, still horny for photogenic dwarf, uh, Keely. Uh, I will give him credit on that storyline. I did not see the end of that coming. I should have, but I did not see the end of that coming. I'm not going to spoil it, though, because it wasn't perfect. But, you know, I, I give him props for trying. Uh, but he ends up fighting Keely and Evangeline Lily, and then... You think he dies there, but no, he doesn't die there. He comes back, and then Legolas has to fight him, and then it looks like Thorin saves Legolas from him, but then the, he comes back again, and then finally Legolas fucking kills him on a sequence, which I swear is straight out of Uncharted, uh, or a game like that, where it's just like they're on a crumbling bridge, and the bridge just keeps crumbling more and more. It's not a bridge. It's a tower he knocked down to form a bridge. Eh, long story. And so they're fighting each other on that, and it keeps crumbling more and more and more. And then it only finally crumbles after Legolas stabs the other guy in the head, and he falls down and dies. And then you have main villain orc, uh, whose name I forget. Uh, and he has a long extended fight sequence with Thorin too on a on a frozen lake. Which give him credit, that's a clever place to have a fun showdown. You can do some fun stuff with that, and they do. Uh, they did have one fake out death with him, that. I'm both glad and not uh, and not glad they didn't end up going with because I mean as his final death because what happens is of course they're on the frozen lake and there's a part where uh, at this point the pale or guy has this giant ass uh, ball and chain thing he's using to try and break Thorn in half basically and of course it breaks up the ice and they end up on like an ice piece together and <laughs> it almost ends on like Looney Tune logic because. And I'm not making this up. This actually happens in the movie. Thorn grabs the ice, the block, the chain, ball and chain, throws it at the pale orc. The pale orc grab, catches it, and it's almost like, Durr! and then Thorn steps off the ice block and he falls into the frozen water. <laughs> it's like, that is something I would see out of a goddamn Bugs Bunny cartoon. And 
of course, that's not what actually kills him. He eventually breaks out of the ice and ends up fighting Thorin some more, and stuff happens, which I'm not going to spoil. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things. And then he, it kind of made me mad, though, because I, there's a, Thorin sees the Pale Orc uh, floating underneath the ice, and he's kind of watching it, and he's kind of following it, and then, like, trying to see if it stays dead or not. My thought was, like, don't even get close to that shit. He's gonna pop back up, and he does. So I was like, well, that was just really bad decision-making. And... And here's one other thing. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I keep complaining, but... Can somebody give a throwaway line of why we can't just use the eagles for everything. Jesus Christ! It's like Eagle Ex Machina, again, in this movie! We're just like, dear God! At least this one drops Bear Man from the last movie. He just turns into bear mid-air and just kills everyone. That was kind of cool. But, I was like, oh, I'm like, we're really doing this again? You had a whole... There was no linear story you had to follow here. You could have done so many different things. But instead, you did the exact same shit you did in the last Lord of the Rings movies. I don't know. I guess I'm more mad at what it could have been rather than what it actually is. As for what it is, it's good. It's fine. It's entertaining. It's like, if you like the other two Lord of the movies, you'll like this one fine. Personally, I guess I think I'd put it... Uh, Probably in the bottom as far as quality goes in the in the Hobbit trilogy. Um, it's like I'm saying, I'm not mad that I saw it. I don't want to get any bad impressions. I think it just could have been a lot better than what it was. I think it had a lot of potential. I think I think the things that they did do right was Thorin and the stuff with the other dwarves. I also like Bilbo's story, and I liked how that ended. Uh, it does kind of do that thing in Return of the King where it has like one too many things that should be endings but aren't. Uh, it's not as bad in this movie. In this case, it's much more forgivable in this movie than it was in Return of the King, where in Return of the King, it was like, oh my god, we're doing this again! Why can't we just end? But, uh, yeah. Like, I, I can't try to think. Is there anything else I want to talk about? I think I covered the majority of the big things. Um, sorry, our Mitches. Oh, I know, there is one other thing I want to talk about, is I felt like, oh! Now I remember, I got one more complaint, and I'll talk about things I actually I did like about this movie, is there was one character in this movie. What happens is is uh, Stephen Fry's character, who is the master of Lake Town in the last movie, dies pretty much in the first five minutes in this movie, and Bard takes over. Bard, who, give credit, is still kind of a dull character, but he is made more, much more interesting in this one. If nothing else, his son kicks ass. Duke gives credit. His son is actually pretty kick-ass uh, for, like, a seven-year-old. But, uh, Alfred, who was the master's sidekick slash minion in the last movie, I can't figure out why they kept this character around. I don't know why. He doesn't do anything. Like, there's... Allow me to explain. So, Alfred, who was the sleazy discount Grima Wormaton from the last movie, is in this movie quite a bit. And... To me, it's, it almost seems that it made no sense to me because he kind of he realizes that you know being the Weasley guy he is, he tries to suck up to Bard and uh, like tries to become his new henchman. Uh, but Bard, knowing full well who he is, what he is, what he's capable of, and kind of what just generally what kind of person he is, keeps giving him things to do. And my thought is. Why would you give this guy anything to do? He's clearly not trustworthy. He fucks up every single time. Literally, every single time they give him something to do, he finds a way to fuck it up. Either he doesn't pay attention or he finds a sleazeball way to get out of it. He does nothing of value. He's only there to get some cheesy lesson at the very end of the movie. And it's not worth it. Like... What should have happened is he should either die with Stephen Fry or Barcher's like, you are worthless, get out. I don't know why anyone kept giving him things to do. 
like they kept not just like oh go move, go over there dude he's like they kept giving him like important tasks it's like why would you do that why would you ever trust someone who is very clearly a sleazeball he act that he frankly has sleazeball written in his fucking unibrow why do you keep giving him shit to do But yeah, uh, Smog's pretty cool. Uh, like Bard Moore as a character, it's like I said, so bland, but they made it more interesting. Uh... <laughs> yeah, oddly enough, I liked it better in Dracula than I'm told, <laughs> which is such a weird thing to say. But yeah, maybe that's because I just enjoy the movies a B movie. Um... But yeah, I think I've covered most of the basics. Like the story with Thorn and trying to find the Arkenstone is very well done. Like, and I liked how he he kind of finally realizes how much of a dick he's been since he's kind of become gold obsessed, and the search for the Arkenstone and all that. And yeah, I think I've pretty much covered everything. So there's not much left to say except if you're looking for anything complex you're probably going to be disappointed. Like, it's still not as good as the other Lord of the Rings movies. It's not even as good as some of the other Hobbit movies. But it's entertaining. It's a good couple, like a two and a half hour action romp. Um, it is a nice conclusion to the story. It does wrap things up for the most part. Um, and tie in stuff to the first Lord of the Rings movie. There was one little extra scene I liked in this movie. This one's kind of spoilerish. Is at the end of the movie where Gandalf is uh, escorting Bilbo back to the Shire. There was a brief little scene where uh, uh, Gandalf just basically like I was kind of wondering at that point. It's like, but wait a minute. In the f like at this point. Bilbo has not shown Gandalf that he has the ring. So I was like, so wait a minute, how does Gandalf know? Because he clearly knows in the Fellowship how that he has the ring. And at the very end, Gandalf just says, I know you have a power ring. I know you found it at the Goblin Cave. You're not fooling anyone. Just be careful with the fucking thing and don't do anything stupid. It's kind of what it comes down to. I kind of like that little scene. Um... So yeah, I mean, after I've ranted this long, you probably know whether or not you're going to like this movie. Um, so I guess take that as you will. Uh, I did get a few trailers. I guess one or two of them are worthy of talking about, so let me pull them up here. Yeah, the trailers I do solo are always the shortest ones. There we are. Okay. Oh, God. Yeah, I didn't like any of these trailers. Uh, we got one, I got another one for Jupiter Ascending. I'm sorry, that movie looks so fucking stupid. It looks really fucking dumb. I don't know, it's... Uh, I think I've talked about it before, so I'm, it's not really worth talking about. It just looks like a dumb sci-fi movie, to be honest. But, you know, a princess and... I will give credit, Channing Tatum is the only person in existence I think that would ever friendzone Mila Kunis. Oh, that is one of the things I liked. Legolas in this movie. Uh actually takes the friend zone thing pretty well to give him credit uh as far as i know evangeline lily is the only woman who would ever friend zone orlando bloom but yeah he takes it pretty well he's actually a pretty good champ and he's you know give him credit he's willing to stand by the woman he may or he, like he really likes regardless of whether or not you know he loves, she loves him back or anything like that. Maybe I just feel that. <laughs> Maybe I'm just more sympathetic in this one because, like, oh man, been there, brother. I know the, I know the feels. I know the pain. But uh, it's like, okay, that's actually kind of respectable. All right, good for you. We still have values. Okay. Um. Anyway, there you got. I got a trailer for Into the Woods, and this movie. I don't. This movie is really confusing, because. As, as, I don't know anything about the book or the play or whatever it is. I know this one is a musical. I know that the music they played in the trailer, which I'm assuming is the actual some actual songs from the movie, doesn't match the visuals at all. Like it's kind of happy-go-lucky, kind of wicked style-esque uh, musical, and yet the visuals are really dark and dank and just murky. Uh, so it's like I don't know where they're going with this, and. The one thing in particular that really just off-putting is Johnny Depp in this movie uh, plays the big bad wolf. Really, just call him the wolf, but he looks like a 
gambling furry jackrabbit. Like, he has, like, a fucking, like, barbershop hat and shit, and he's, like, wearing striped shirt. He's got a weird little, must like, mustache thing. He's got ears. It's like, that's, that's the big bad wolf. Okay. I mean, it's, it's better than the last Red Riding Hood movie I saw, but still. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's got an all-star cast. Maybe it won't suck. I don't know. The trailer did not convince me all too much. Uh, so, I don't know. We'll see. And then, oh, yeah, Insurgent. Okay, you know, I can get fucking shit about this movie. Like I said, it looks like it's trying to be another Hunger Games-esque thing. It's looking like it's trying to be the next big t young adult franchise. It's trying to be a big epic thing. All I could think about when I was seeing this is, like, I've seen all this shit before. Four, and I've seen it done better. It's like, like I say that a lot. It's like I'm nothing. I don't have anything too much against doing something that's been done before. Pretty much everything's been done before. But if you gotta do something redundant, something we've seen a million times, at least try to give it a twist that keeps it from being stale. This one does not look like it does that. There's a chosen one, basically. There's like a chosen one, and the scene where there's actually a scene in the trailer. Where it says, uh, where she, like she's like the main character. I don't know her name. Is like cons uh, attached to this machinery by the bad guys, and she go and she looks at the main villain and goes, "I'm not gonna fight you." And she goes, "No, you're going to fight yourself." And the camera pans and it's like it's doppelganger version of her. I was like, "Oh dear God, really? Oh Jesus Christ!" I mean, I don't usually like shit like that. I don't know why. I'm a sucker for it. But this one is so ham-fisted. I'm like, you really expect me to take this seriously? Okay. Whew, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of bitching tonight. Okay, so... Yeah, I think it wraps it up. So, I, I liked the third Hobbit movie. I have my fair amount of complaints. But, you know, overall, I still liked it. I still enjoyed it. So, take that as you will. Uh, I gotta get back to work at home because I still really gotta rush to get this Christmas project done. So, see you... We'll be back tomorrow with Exodus, and we're doing a double, um, me and Muha are doing a double feature, so we'll be doing uh, Exodus with uh, Babadook, uh, which is an Australian horror movie. So, yep, that's it, guys. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time. Yeah, that is not the off button. Where is the off button? There it is.